I'm so glad to, to be with you again this morning and, and actually really excited to be with you uh, over the next few weeks as well. And uh, I thought I would begin this morning with, uh, with a question. Um, how many of you enjoy sharing a meal with someone else, maybe a friend uh, or a family member, a spouse or a significant other? Um, if you spend any amount of time with me, uh, one of the things that you'll know is that uh, I love uh, eating meals with people. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of living. I love food and I love people and I love eating food with people. And this last year, um, as we've experienced this uh, terrible pandemic, it's, we've experienced so much loss and we've, we've, it's been painful in so many ways. But I think one of the things for me uh, that's been so difficult uh, is not being able to come to, uh, and have a meal. Um, I can't wait for a time when I'll be able to sit around uh, again with, around the table with my friends, uh, with my family again, to eat a meal without a mask, uh, to eat a meal without having to think about uh, how close or how far apart I am uh, from somebody else. But until then, uh, what I thought would be a fun exercise to do today is, is to imagine ourselves sitting around the table uh, with Jesus, um, you know, uh, having Jesus over to dinner for pizza or for ice cream or, and, and Jesus sitting with us at our table uh, without a mask uh, and obviously without having to have a vaccine because he's Jesus. Isn't that a comforting image? I think the good news is that we don't actually have to work too hard uh, in our imaginations to, to, to think about what it might be like uh, to sit at a table with Jesus and have a meal because uh, one of the interesting things about Jesus' life and his ministry uh, is that he often ate and drank with others. In fact, in all the gospels, but in Luke in particular, uh, we have record of Jesus sitting down for meals with various people. And this reality has prompted one writer to say that Luke's gospel in particular, it seems like Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. And this was such a prominent characteristic of his lifestyle uh, that many of his opponents actually accused him of being a gluttonous drunkard. And so it's to those meals uh, that I want to turn our attention uh, over the next few weeks. And although each of these meals are so different, uh, what I think we'll find in all of them is how Jesus so often uses these ordinary moments to reveal extraordinary truths. It's, it's really in the ordinariness of life, I think that Jesus speaks and guides and teaches us about him and about ourselves and about how we ought to live. And so uh, if you have your Bible, again, we're going to be looking at uh, seven, uh, Luke 7, uh, verses 36 through 50, the passage that we just read. And in this story, Jesus is really going to go to great lengths to help this Pharisee here see himself as he truly is. He's going to try to help him see something about himself that if he doesn't discover, then he's never really going to be able to see and embrace Jesus as he truly is. And so what we're going to discover is that this Pharisee isn't being honest with himself. He's blinded. He's lacking true awareness of who he really is. And I think as we walk through this story, what we're going to see is, is that we struggle with the same thing. So often we struggle to see ourselves as we truly are. And the danger for us is similar to, to what it was for the Pharisee. If, if we don't see ourselves as we truly are, then we'll never see and respond to Jesus as we truly should. So before I jump into the story, let us uh, let me just pray for us uh, before we get started. God, thank you for this story. Thank you for uh, how you've revealed yourself to us in the gospels and how you've, you've shown us that, that you aren't just this amazing, grand, holy God, but that you are a God who comes down and who eats with us and who speaks to us in the ordinariness of life. And so I pray that you would do that for us today. I pray that you would speak to us through your word and that you would speak to us through the story and that you would give us hearts that are open and ears to hear and that you would be with me as I speak, God, that you would allow me to speak clearly and that you would allow me to speak uh, what your word says here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we explore this meal together, Jesus is going to help this Pharisee discover his true self by really leveraging three tools. He is going to use a disruption uh, that really serves as sort of a demonstration. 
he is going to use a parable and then he is going to use a contrast. And so, so let's walk through this story together. And it really begins uh, with an invitation. Uh, Jesus has been traveling around, speaking in synagogues. He's been healing the sick. He's been performing miracles, calling his disciples, and, and beginning to reveal himself as the Messiah, as, as the one who can forgive sins. And after a time of preaching in this local synagogue, Luke tells us that a Pharisee invites Jesus over for a meal. And we don't really know what prompted the invitation. Uh, it was certainly customary and often considered a noble act for someone to invite a traveling rabbi like this to dine at their home. It's possible that the Pharisee was intrigued or, or had a reputation for mingling with the famous religious elite. And it's even possible that he wondered if this was tr truly someone sent from God. And although we don't really know what motivated him, we do know that he was kind of a lousy host. If you were invited to someone's house in this context, the general cultural expectation was that you would greet the guest with a kiss of peace. You would either have your servant remove their sandals and wash their feet, or, or you would provide water for them to wash their own feet so that they could enjoy the meal without dust all over them. And you would give them some olive oil to anoint their head with oil as a means of refreshment before the meal. And as the Pharisee hosts Jesus, he doesn't appear to extend anything close to this sort of hospitality to him. If, if this meal were happening in our day, it, it would be like Jesus coming to the door and, and no one taking his coat. So he's sort of left awkwardly trying to figure out what to do with it. Or, or instead of greeting him at the door, it would be like just kind of waving him in without really making any sort of eye contact or any, any formal greeting, just hoping he sort of finds a seat. And, and I wonder, have any of you ever been to someone's house where you just didn't feel welcome. You just wondered, does this person really want me here? And, and this is what's going on with Jesus and this Pharisee. There's some subtle rudeness happening. And if I were Jesus, if, if I were the savior of the world who humbled himself and, and come down into this world full of people who are snubbing him, I would very likely put this little Pharisee in his place. I'd, I'd probably do something offensive, like miraculously create a basin of water and, and slowly wash my feet while making uncomfortable eye contact with him with a, with a nice little sly grin on my face. Or, or maybe I would use my power to have the container of oil magically appear in my hand. And whatever I would do, it would be dramatic and it would be in your face. But Jesus is always so much more gracious than me. He never abuses his power or, or uses it for his own good or, or to exalt himself because that's the kind of God he is. He's all powerful. He's humble. And so instead of uh, doing any of that, Jesus ignores these slights and we're told that he reclines at the table. Rather than allowing his host to, uh, his host's rudeness to, to get under his skin or, or to make him lose his temper, he instead uses it as an opportunity to help the Pharisee get a clearer picture of, of who he really is and, and see something crucial about himself. And he does so first by embracing a disruption that's really a demonstration of something incredible. Again, in this context, meals were usually shared around a U-shaped table and, and they had low-lying couches on which you would lay, stretched out on your left elbow, and then you would use your right hand to eat. And when I think about it, I really think we're doing it all wrong, right? Who wants to sit upright in a chair and be confined when you could be stretched out? And typically a formal meal would take place at the center of someone's home or, or in a place where the rest of the community also had access because while this was a meal, it was usually much more than a meal. Often the first part of the meal was the reclining and the eating. And then the second part would involve more formal conversation or or instruction. And it's this formal conversation that the uninvited guests would be interested in overhearing. They, it was a form of entertainment. And so while Jesus is stretched out around this table and, and while there are probably quite a few others gathered around to listen in, Luke tells us that there was a pretty dramatic disruption. Starting in verse 37 and 38, it says, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing beside him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So as Jesus is dining and, and being disrespected, someone from the crowd suddenly comes close to him and, and begins not to just greet him like he should have been greeted, 
but goes above and beyond. And, and this is where the story gets really interesting because the person who's performing this greeting is someone who normally doesn't show up to these sorts of gatherings. He writes, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. If we had been in the audience, this would certainly have been something to behold because this woman who is simply characterized here as a sinner likely has a reputation. She's an outcast. She's someone who was likely a prostitute and, and she shows up at this dinner and I'm sure even when she just walked into the room, it made everyone feel a little bit uncomfortable. Do you know someone like that? Someone that when they walk into the room, everyone looks, everyone gets a little bit more alert. Jesus says she's a sinner, she's been labeled, she's notorious. And so everyone in the community looked down on her in disgust, but, but it's not just that her presence is bothersome, it's also how she behaves. Most scholars believe that she must have already had some sort of deep encounter with Jesus and his offer of grace and forgiveness uh, during one of his other teaching times or, or while he was doing some other sort of miracle. And so he'd likely already shown her some kindness and, and the deep love that he had for her regardless of her past. And so she's probably never really felt truly accepted by any man until she met Jesus. And so when she heard he was going to be at this Pharisee's house, she musters up as much courage as she can, and, and she goes in to watch and to listen. And, but as she's observing and she's noticing how Jesus is being so disrespected, she's, she's overwhelmed with emotion. And she decides, if, if the Pharisee isn't going to wash Jesus' feet, then I think I'll do it. And so she interrupts the meal, something that, that would have been very inappropriate, and, and she begins to wash his feet. But then as she begins to wash, her heart continues to flood with gratitude as she thinks about how this man has changed her life. And, and so she begins to cry and the water is beginning to cause more of a mess. And, and because she doesn't have a towel, she uses what she has, her hair. And I imagine her, so I imagine her here, she's, she's frantically trying to clean his feet and then the tears are causing the dirt to turn to mud and it's making his feet dirtier. So she panics and, and she does something that at this time was culturally inappropriate. She lets down her hair to wipe his feet. And, and if she were doing this in our community, it would be similar to if, as if she had just taken off her shirt to wash his feet. It would have been viewed as a seductive act. But because her heart is so full, she, she continues cleaning his feet. And, and instead of simply giving him the kiss of peace, in humility, she kisses not his head, but his feet. And she pulls out her alabaster jar and and she doesn't just anoint his head, but instead anoints his feet with her expensive perfume. And, and this woman is pouring out her heart to Jesus because she's been overwhelmed by his grace and his offer of forgiveness. You see, she knows something about herself. She knows that she is as bad as everyone says. She knows that she's a sinner. And so when she was in the crowd, probably at one of the gatherings where Jesus was teaching and extending again this message of forgiveness, she was overwhelmed with love and gratitude. And this deep love and gratitude worked itself out in this dramatic display of affection. This demonstration here, this disruption here is a demonstration of how we all ought to respond to Jesus. Friends, when is the last time your heart was overwhelmed with love and gratitude to Jesus because of his grace and his forgiveness that he's extended to you? This sort of dramatic display ought to resonate with all of those who call ourselves forgiven. If she had done this to anyone else in the room, they would have pulled back immediately or, or scolded her or, or cast her out. I wonder how you would respond if a prostitute came to you at, at a restaurant while you were eating and gave you this sort of greeting. How do you think everyone else at the restaurant would respond? We don't really know exactly how Jesus responds other than not doing what we think most people would, which is recoil. But we do know how this Pharisee responds. He doesn't verbalize anything, of course, but Luke tells us that what was going through his mind in verse 39, he says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. You can hear the disdain in his voice. 
He should have known who and what kind of woman she is who's touching him. He clearly can't be a prophet from God. And it's in this response that we begin to see what it is that he's missing about himself. What it is that Jesus is hoping to help him discover. He's in a position where he's, he's built up a lot of credibility. He, he works hard. He's probably been admired for his success. He's achieved so much in his life. He, he's kept so many rules and regulations. He's distinguished himself. He's probably memorized large portions of the scriptures. And, and you know he's a tither. And so when people look at him, they probably say something like, you know, that Pharisee, he's, he's a decent man. And he knows that everyone knows that he's just a great guy. And so when he looks at this woman, he's, he's fooled into believing that he's somehow superior. That he's above this kind of life, that he's more righteous. But friends, he's only being fooled. He know better than she is. When you look at other people whose life is a mess, I wonder what you see. How does it make you feel? If you're like me, the temptation is to feel proud or, or to be thankful that I'm not like that person. But that's such a dangerous place to be. When we start acting as the judge of who is good and who is bad, we're in a danger of minimizing our own mess, of missing what's really going on in our own souls. You see, we have this tendency, I think, don't we, to minimize our mess. Uh, and when we minimize it, we, we miss out on being able to truly experience and, and appropriately respond to the grace and the forgiveness that God has extended to us. And so instead of seeing ourselves in this woman, we focus on how we're different, on how we're better. But Jesus won't let this Pharisee, and he, and he won't let us get away with this sort of thinking. Instead, he wants to help us see ourselves as we truly are, so we can see and respond to him as we truly should. That's why after this amazing disruption, a disruption that's really a demonstration that shows us exactly how we ought to view ourselves and, and how we ought to respond to God's grace, he continues by sharing a parable. That's the second thing we see in verse 40. And, and Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And into this very awkward scene where everyone appears to be very uncomfortable, Jesus finally breaks the silence by calling this Pharisee by his name, Simon, and saying that he'd like to tell him something, something that clearly relates to what Simon and, and likely what everyone else is thinking. He tells him this story about two debtors. And if we aren't careful, I think we can get confused by what he's actually trying to communicate here. Both of these debtors owe this money lender a substantial amount of money. One would be equivalent to a few months worth of wages, and the other would be the equivalent of almost two years worth of wages. And, and so while on paper, one is a little less than the other, they're both in a position of inability to pay. It's very likely that, that neither of them will ever be able to pay this money lender back. And so, so there's a degree of difference here, but, but they're both equally bankrupt. And so after telling him this story, Jesus goes on to ask Simon a question. He says, which one of them will love him more? Of these two forgiven debtors, which one will have a deeper affection for him? It's an interesting question, I think. And you have to appreciate Simon's response. He, he tries to be as non-committal as possible. He says, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. He's trying to make sure he doesn't actually get caught up in one of Jesus' tricks. He's, he's doing what my daughter does when she's playing Connect Four with me, and she isn't sure if, if putting this next piece in the hole is going to set her up to lose. So she sort of halfway puts it in and, and tries to see what my reaction is 
is going to be. And so, so, but Jesus' reaction here is favorable. He, he affirms his answer. He says, you've judged rightly. Now, at first glance, I think we might conclude that, that what Jesus is trying to communicate in this story is that in actuality, the woman's sins are much greater than Simon's sins. So, so that's why her love for, her, for him seems to be so much greater. See, she's been forgiven a lot more, right? So, so she's a mess and, and, and has done God knows what. And, and innocent little Simon over here, he's really, he's only needs a little bit of forgiveness to sort of top him off, to make him right with God. But is that what Jesus is saying? Is he trying to get us, him to see here that it's just harder for Simon to love him because Simon's only made a few mistakes and only needs a, a few boxes of forgiveness? While this woman here, she needs a whole warehouse full of forgiveness. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. Instead, Jesus seems to be saying someone's perception of the gravity of their debt has a direct correlation to how deeply they appreciate their forgiveness. And so if you perceive your debt to be small, then you probably won't have really appreciate the forgiveness that you've been given. You won't think it's that big of a deal. But if the perception of your debt is great, if the perception of your debt is that you are hopeless, then your heart will overflow with love and gratitude when you've been forgiven. Simon here is blinded by his decency. He's fooled by his man-made categories of who's considered righteous and who's considered a sinner. He's foolishly categorized people into those who are righteous and, and those who are sinners. But Simon is wrong. Why? Well, we know from the scripture that, that there is no one righteous. No one is righteous except for Jesus. His sins are just as bad as the woman's, even though they aren't as visible. But Simon doesn't see it that way. He's still clinging to his decency, even though he can judge rightly the scenario of Jesus' story. When he looks at this woman, he sees a sinner, but when he looks at himself, he sees something different. Friends, what is it that you see when you look at yourself? Do you see yourself as a little sinner or as the chief of sinners? The only way you'll ever be able to truly appreciate the forgiveness that you've you've been given in Jesus is by coming to the re this realization here that you are a mess, that you are a lot more sinful than you realize. Pray that God would continue to reveal to you and awaken your heart and mind to just how broken that you are. But just in case Simon misses the subtlety of the parable and, and still hasn't been able to grasp what he's trying to reveal to him, Jesus goes on to ask a startling question and then contrasts Simon's behavior with this woman's. Verse 44, then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? He urges Simon to do something he's probably been avoiding during this entire encounter. He asks whether he sees her. What a startling question. We know Simon sees her sin. We know he sees all the bad stuff about her. But what Simon's missing is that this woman, that he and this woman are so much more alike. And this woman is so much more than just a sinner. She's a sinner, but she's also made in God's image. She's messed up, but she's also been transformed by grace. She's come to the end of herself and, and she's falling at the feet of Jesus and embracing the forgiveness that only he can give. Simon, do you see her? Do you see what she's demonstrating before your very eyes? There are so many Simons in this world. But friends, if you see yourself like this woman saw herself, and if, if your past is marked by your mess, I just want to encourage you, the Simons of this world may not see you, but Jesus sees you. He sees your heart and he sees your thoughts. He knows your true heart just like he saw this woman's heart. Jesus sees this woman and Jesus also sees Simon's heart and thoughts too. 
And this is why he continues by contrasting Simon's rude behavior with this woman's. Verse 44 again, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he was forgiven little, loves little. Simon sees himself here as so much more righteous than this woman, yet, yet Jesus says, hold on a second. Let's consider this dinner you're hosting. You've been rude and inconsiderate, but she's gone above and beyond. Simon, you aren't more righteous than her. If we're using your categories, you're less. Simon, if, if you are honest with yourself, you believe that you don't actually need to be forgiven. You think you've achieved favor with God on your own. Simon, your problem is that you think if, if push comes to, to shove, you suppose you might just need a little forgiveness. Simon has fallen into this trap of thinking of himself more highly than he ought, and it's blinding him to who he truly is and to what he truly needs. And friends, we're all guilty of this. We get into a Christian community. We begin to work hard for Jesus. We, we clean ourselves up. We, we make good decisions. And and our heart, hearts begin to forget or, or to lose sight of just how bad we really are, of just how great our debt really is. And when we forget, when we lose sight of our true selves, then we begin to devalue the gospel. It becomes more and more challenging to really love and appreciate what Jesus has done and is doing for us. Friends, have you lost sight of it? I know it's often, scare, it's often a scary and a disturbing thing to consider. But we don't want to dwell on the negative. We, we want to try to move on from our sin. But if we grasp and remember and, and think about and, and really know who we are, if we, if we don't ever get there, then, then we'll never be able to fully grasp the love that Jesus has for us. Jesus loves you. Not to pretend you, not the one who puts on a bunch of spiritual makeup. He loves the real you with all of your imperfections. And, and when you see that, it will light your soul on fire. It will stir you to express yourself to God in a way similar to how this woman did. One of the things that I love about this story is, is how it ends. You know, we hear how it ends for the crowd, they're left in awe. They wonder, who is this who even forgives sins? And we know how it ends for the woman. Jesus affirms her publicly and affirms her faith and affirms that she's been forgiven. But we're left in silence about how this ends for Simon the Pharisee. Did the blinders on his eyes finally come off? Did he finally get honest with himself about who he truly is? Did God finally awaken him to see that just like all of us, he's in desperate need of forgiveness? Or did he remain committed to this idea that he was a decent man? That he wasn't perfect, but, but at least he was a little bit better than those sinners. Friends, I wonder this morning, how will this story end for you? I would ask you, just like Jesus asked Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her in you? I pray that you'll, you'll give up this false thinking that we are just good enough. I pray that God will awaken all of us each day to what and how and, and where we fall so far short of his expectations. And, and as we come to that realization, I pray that it would light our hearts on fire. I pray that it would cause us to cling to Jesus and to sing to Jesus and, and to praise and worship him with full hearts for the forgiveness that he's extended to us in the gospel. Let's pray. God, thank you that you love us, that you love the true us, that you love us with all of our imperfections and that you know us 
that you know everything about us and you still welcome us into your world. That you still welcome us into your arms. God, I pray for us today. I pray for our hearts, God, that you would, that you would continue to reveal to us, that you would allow us to not be blinded by our good deeds, God, but that you would just continue to remind us that we are in desperate need without you and without your forgiveness. And would you allow us to experience that this morning? Allow us to experience the joy and the gratitude and the love that comes from, from knowing that we've been forgiven by you and knowing that we, that we are your friends and that, we, uh, and that you're loved, we are loved by you. In Jesus' name, amen.